David Sampson, John Skipper, thank you for, for coming on. Again, as always, on the sporting class. Rich guy OnlyFans, as I like to say. I feel like we'd earn more money if we were actually in OnlyFans account. <laughs> and I have shoes on. I'm pretty sure I'm not getting paid for this show. So, <laughs> um, I th actually, I think you're paying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not paying myself. We're currently paying show. David to not show his feet <laughs> on camera, actually, specifically. Um, before we get into what we're here to talk about today, I want to point out, in the world of sports business, I'm Pablo Torre finds out this week. We have a giant story I'm very proud of. It's an investigation by a company called Hunterbrook Media. We interviewed the reporter on that story into Matt Ishbia, into the Phoenix Suns, Isaiah Thomas. All that stuff is over there. It's a bit of a live story. We'll cover it, revisit it as the days and weeks come. But I want to get into what we are safely able to say today because there is news that is, I think, underrated when it comes to its influence on sports and the sports business economy. Because this Disney investor, shareholder meeting fight, there's an activist investor named Nelson Peltz, an activist shareholder, David Sampson. Uh, and what is at stake here? What has been resolved that we can say as we cover this story endlessly? The future of sports rights. It's a proxy battle. And the reason why it's interesting is, of course, ESPN is owned by Disney. And Disney is a large company that has a board of directors. And when you invest enough money into a company, you feel like you want to say in how it's operated. And so there are hedge funds that take positions in companies. There's individuals sometimes who take positions. Nelson Peltz is an individual who loves buying big chunks of companies and then telling them how to do their job better by saying, I'll do it better. I want to get on the board of directors and I want to influence the future of this company. And Nelson Peltz did it with Disney. Mm -hmm. And ESPN was really his focus, thinking that we can do better here with ESPN, whether it's to spin it off or whether it's to spin off the streaming network. We need Disney shares to perform better. And what activist shareholders do is they buy shares and they want those share prices to go up and they don't care about sports or. Well, well in fact, you know more about this than I do. The Pelts went into this with the intention of accumulating shares, creating some level of what he would call activism, but what other people would call interference in the running of the Walt Disney Company. And he's doing it for the sole purpose of hoping that investors will believe him, drive the shares up, and he'll make money and sell. Uh, I think what it means from yesterday. Cars. Oh, what, <laughs> it, you just what, it means, that. what it means from yesterday doesn't mean anything. I never thought this guy had a shot at doing this. Generally, the overwhelming share of the institutional investors in Disney and all the mom and pop guy folks who own Disney because they have beloved feelings about it are going to support Bob Iger. He's consistently delivered with the uh, with ha with an exception of a very difficult 2022. And um, uh, I don't think the I don't think th this this is part of the oh, continuing discussion about should they sell ESPN. I've right. consistently said there's no reason to sell ESPN. Still puts off a lot of cash. Sports is still very important. Why would you abandon that? This is, I think, an affirmation that the majority of people think that the way Disney is running this is the right way to go. I've heard you toe the corporate line before, mm -hmm. but this may be an all-timer because you are absolutely having total disregard to share price uh -huh. and the valuation and the fact that under Iger in the second time around, remember he took over after leaving mm -hmm. because he wasn't happy with who he put in as his own successor, and now that he's been back, the shares have not performed. Uh, this year, they're better. They certainly are performing mm -hmm. this year. But you act as though what Nelson Peltz is doing, and he's no saint. Mm -hmm. He is the original Richard Gere from Pretty Woman. That's what he does without Meaning. having ever met Julia Roberts. He buys stuff and wants to tear it apart to see if the parts are more than the whole. Or he'll buy parts of a company, trying to get more of the company right. to get the shares up of course, to make money. Yes. That's your summary of Pretty Woman's plot? I think so. Isn't that what Pretty Woman um, is about? I, I can't quite recollect, and I also think that's probably territory I'm not <laughs> headed into at all. Because we are not, and we're no longer <laughs> in the days when I think it can be funny that you. Uh, I, I, just, I just am fascinated as to how David Sampson sees, of course, activist investing in the plot of Pretty Woman. But I digress, John. Excuse me. No, I no. I, that was much more entertaining than anything I have to add at this point. No, I think um, what you added was ex exceptionally telling to me because Bob Iger, who is the CEO of mm -hmm. Disney, he doesn't want shareholders getting up in his business. No chairman yeah. does. No president right. does. However, 
in a public company, there are activists. Nelson Peltz has done this before with other yeah. companies, which aren't being run as efficiently as he would like. Right. Now, I would say there are two things, right? One is that, of course, it's appropriate in many cases for there to be activist shareholders because many companies have a better alternative and have been improved by that. In this case, I think what Nelson, what, what Nelson, Nelson Peltz was suggesting would not have made Disney more valuable. I think it potentially could have driven the stock up briefly, but I don't really think so. I think that I have no problem with activism. I think in this case he was wrong, and the shareholders were correct in affirming that Disney is doing what they need to do. So they clearly still have some things to work through. It's a big win for Bob Iger. Let's yes. make no mistake and about it. And for ESPN. So that's the interesting thing that I'm thinking Question about. Mark. Where is Jimmy Pitaro in this? So when these activist shareholders, when these proxy battles happen, you have to choose a horse. Now, Jimmy Pitaro could have chosen the Nelson Peltz horse. He didn't, but he could have. And it's what happens in the baseball world, in the corporate world, in every it's what company. happens at co-op boards. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. And so, Jimmy, there has to be a succession plan for Bob, which is what Nelson Peltz had really been talking about that he was concerned with. Well, and with. Nelson brings with him Jay Rizzullo, who was the former CFO, ran the parks at one point, and was a candidate for the CEO job and didn't get it. So he's, I assume, bringing along, you'll understand about this better than I do, Jay, He's bringing on the CEO he would probably install. And so you're, to replace asking, Iger. Uh, you're asking the question of, gee, Jimmy theoretically could have done the same thing. I don't generally like to comment much on the people who are at my former employer, uh, just out of respect. But it is Jimmy Pataro's character would never allow him right. to do an uprising against Bob Iger. He is, you know, he he's uh, in the inner circle there. He and Bob are tight, and it's not... Not within re he could not have done that. So I used to work himself. at a place called Morgan Stanley, and there was an inner circle, and the inner circle was super tight until the succession plan became clear, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the inner circle was not as tight because people left who lost. If there's three people as a candidate to succeed, generally what happens is the losers in that fight to be CEO do not stay. Yeah, you, you have not seen though any of the folks other now than Jay Rizzullo who have lost in this, they've not caused issues. They've left. Uh, that's the same but, thing. But we had Jimmy a hasn't won yet, and he hasn't lost. He still could be a candidate I, I, in the succession. I think play. Bob has a very tight inner circle, and I do. I would be surprised if anybody currently employed by the company did anything close to that. Can I just frame this around uh, just how much this mattered, though, in terms of the, the financial outlay to win an election like this? How would you estimate that, David, the cost of this? It, it was reported that about $70 million was spent, and there were ads on podcasts that yeah, you told I, me I, about. listening to the town, the Ringer podcast, and they played an ad about keeping uh, the, the incumbent shareholder slate, uh, board slate intact. It was a presidential campaign, and in the year that we have a presidential campaign, and I've spent a lot of time, a little bit off the subject, but I'd love to mention No, this. I want to know your insight campaign, into... I love the concept of campaign financing, and I spoke to, and it's not a look at me, Louis, but there was an old senator. His name was Kent Conrad. Kent Conrad... Well, one of the Dakotas. Is, North Dakota, is I think. North Dakota. And uh, a Good brilliant man, man who... I'm so proud of that poll, by the way. That's a, <laughs> yeah, you just winked at me. Amazing. <laughs> that was, I, I thought it was more a twitch, but okay. <laughs> And he always wanted to run a baseball team. And so we switched jobs for a day. And I was senator for a day. And he was president of the Marlins for a day. Oh, that is my, a oh nightmare my gosh. on various my goodness. So I I, went to I'm DC. only hoping there were no close votes in <laughs> so the Senate. I learned about, because he was very much in favor of curbing campaign financing, because that leads to a lot of issues. And I was thinking about it, that the reason why incumbents like it is because they don't want to limit Incumbents want there to be no limits on what you can spend because generally incumbents benefit from it. And so Bob Iger spent a tremendous amount of money as the incumbent to keep power. To keep power. Nelson Peltz spent money like Ross Perot style in an effort to, that's an old reference maybe that will be lost on our audience. I'm old enough to get it, unfortunately. Um, okay, then I feel better. Yeah, about he was Admiral Stockdale's a running mate. It's tens of millions of dollars that Nelson Peltz will spend trying to get people to vote with him. Because what a proxy battle is, it literally is counting votes. If you own a share of stock, you get a vote. And so 
like our elections, very few people voted. Uh, very and few that's people how voted. Bob Iger, the incumbent, ends up winning. As uh, well as my co-op board at home. Yeah. Similar <laughs> dynamic. Maybe take you back to sports because what uh, it does mean is that ESPN likely remains part of the Walt Disney Company, one of the, the groups of people who I think should be happy that this proxy fight didn't succeed are the rights holders, right? Because this means ESPN is still going to be right there as part of the company. A buyer Con- in the marketplace. Yeah, a buyer in the marketplace. I think it's still, I still think we have to watch. Mm-hmm. Because Bob Iger, while he's gotten a direct from the shareholders that he's going to stay in power, I think it's clear to him when you look at the past, and there have been many unsuccessful runs by Nelson mm-hmm. Peltz at Iger, uh, he, and he's sort of done the Heisman mm-hmm. to all of them, but he needs to do something differently. Yeah. And I think he recognizes that. And ESPN, while you say it's never would be in play, I think that there's a scenario where it is in play. Yeah, my, my tendency is to think that ESPN stays there. They've been active. They just renewed the uh, men's college playoff uh, championship, which, by the way, is sort of like winning a bet on a horse when it's like five-eighths of the way through. They won when it was five-eighths. Now they've won when it's six-eighths. I still hear people talking about 12 teams, 14 teams, 16. I'm not sure if they know what they've won yet, but they appear to have won the championship. So I was not aware. They, you think they bought the rights to no matter what the CFP no, is. No, I, 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 and I don't know that we I need to get in here. I think it's a specific number of games is what they got. And I think that college football gets to go after other rights holders, though ESPN, of course, would bid if there yeah, were more No, more I don't games. believe that. I believe they bought it exclusively. So they get every game, no matter how many games. That would be my Without assumption. having to pay more. I, I can't tell you that. I know I've read that exact thing, but I, I don't know why. That's what I would have done. You would buy the whole thing. You want to be the home, and they are the home of college football. So there's been a big dent in that when the Big Ten ended up uh, wow. in the hands of Fox. Yep. yep. So, but we could talk. Um, well, uh, I want to I want to just put a button on this by pointing out that Nelson Peltz, this activist shareholder who tried to mount this revolution, is is he just out of the picture now? I mean, David, you have no. I, I believe you have an even more egregious look at me, Louie, here that I'm just waiting for you to drop because Nelson Peltz is character. It's funny though. Well, I just want to know what do you I, think he does? I grew next? up is, in Nelson Peltz's apartment. Was he there while you were growing no. up? No, <laughs> thankfully he was. Know? That, wait, was that the problem? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly wasn't the solution. Rich guy only fan. I, I, I keep no. getting of content. I keep getting confused with Norman Fell. Remember Norman Fell? From Three's Company, Mr. Yeah. Roper? Yeah. Now I'm so out that, on the reference. So, so I, whenever I think Nelson Peltz, I see Norman Fell's face. Nelson Peltz happens to be a, uh, has an amazing art collection. And uh, I he lived in an apartment on the Upper East Side that was bought by my mother and stepfather. And I went to high school with Nelson's a Horace Manor, and his kids were Horace Manners, and I was in class with uh, his daughter, Brooke Peltz, who was one year older, and he always had this reputation. He was the father in the class who was this titan, but he's grown into a far more Murdoch type later in life. But uh, he left little things in the apartment that we found for years after. What does that mean? So like it's- l- it, Little paintings? It's, I have this visual I, picture of- Little David Sampson <laughs> swinging a, as a two-year-old underneath a, a Monet's lilies. Right. Uh, the most uh, expensive yeah. bassinet. <laughs> no, I was seven. Seven? And they were Degas, Not right. too. So, so out of the bassinet and by it was seven? was Picasso, <laughs> not Monet. Um, okay. It's okay for Nelson Peltz to love art. It's okay that Nelson Peltz lost, but your question is a good one. He still owns all the shares. So is this, so, a, is this a recurring concern? A hundred percent. That's why to me, right. Bob Iger is not done worrying about it because Nelson Peltz didn't, when he lost the proxy battle, he doesn't have to sell his shares. Bob Iger wants him to divest and sell to someone else, but it doesn't mean Nelson Peltz will. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to what ESPN is doing this weekend, which is broadcasting a women's tournament that has hit records that are just unprecedented for women's college basketball and arguably for women's sports in general because the rating that just came out this week for the number of people who watched LSU versus Iowa was 12.3 million. And John, I just want to, again, as the former president of ESPN, just a sense of how eye-opening this number was for you. This is an astonishing number. I mean, this um, number is bigger than NFL games on Amazon Mm. this year, on the Thursday night games. And by the way, we had when we had the poorer Monday night football schedule, we had games on Monday night in this range. The fact that 
a women's college basketball regional final An elite eight, would attract yeah. 12.3 million viewers. It's spectacular. I mean, it's an enormous increase. Uh, ESPN has to be thrilled. They've got a great tournament coming up this weekend. As long as Caitlin Clark, uh, you got Caitlin Clark, you got South Carolina, you got UConn, yep. and NC State. <laughs> As a Tar Heel, it is painful to see the Wolfpack in both tournaments. But back to the ratings, it's, it's enormous. And I think they will do very, very well this weekend. And they're up in the range of uh, big time men's sports championship ratings. This is a bigger rating. I don't know, David, wouldn't you like to get a 12.3 million viewers to a wild card game in baseball? It's a nightmare for Major League Baseball and the <laughs> NBA. It outdrew every NBA oh, game enormous. except for last year's deciding game five. It outdrew every World Series game. Uh, it's a total nightmare. And and I and that is a nightmare the from the perspective of people the, who people in the leagues. If you own a team in basketball or baseball and you see this number for college basketball, women's college basketball, you're despondent. And you will publicly say that everything's great and you love the fact and gender equality and all these things. There are meetings happening right now trying to make sure. And Adam Silver, Rob Manford, believe me, he doesn't want his NBA finals outrated by college basketball. Uh, look, this is a spectacular event. You, you had that. Angel Reese, you had Caitlin <laughs> Clark. One I of the greatest games I've ever seen. Yeah, I don't think personally, but you know the owners better than I do. I do know the commissioners, that you and I both know them. I don't think uh, that Adam is bemoaning or Rob is bemoaning today. Oh my gosh, this is a disaster. I think- Disasters, because it's totally not a, put. They don't want to be, they're it, on every news yeah. show this week with everybody saying the same thing, which is this game outdrew the NBA well, Finals and also do in MLB fairness, World every Series. college football game yeah. last season outside of the this playoff a, in OSU Michigan and the SEC Championship. It's a phenomenon we should celebrate. And by the way, it's not a zero-sum game. Well, I'm assuming you're getting David lots and lots of do, we all new viewers way. in. I mean, if you go see, if you look at the crowd, although I think you were at the LSU. I, I, I was. What do you mean you think? It, Everyone it was, in the world knows he was there. It, it, it's, it's full. It's full of young girls who adore Caitlin Clark. It's, it, you, you've got new fans coming into sports. It, it's, I, don't, it's, I think this is a thing. To, there's no reason to do anything except celebrate this, including... More people watching more sports is good for all the primary sports. Well, I would be more worried if I was a secondary or tertiary sport that I, people only have so much time to spend. If they want to spend it watching baseball games, they're not going to not watch baseball games because they're watching women's college basketball games. I think, I think this is a great phenomenon, and I think we'll have big numbers this week. I'm not sure anything will beat 12-3. That was my next question was, does this feel like – the highest watermark, which will remain as such, a peak, or is this what? Caitlin Clark has to be in the final for there to be a chance to beat that. If she's in the final, they could easily, they could do 15 to 20 million viewers. Mm. So one of the things that I was thinking about is, hopefully this is, it. again, I'm putting my league hat on, and I'm a little not, I don't agree with you, John, from my standpoint, where I didn't say it was a disaster, but it's just a talking point that we don't want any part of when we're involved in leagues. You don't well, want the talking Despondent, I believe, was the adjective. Beyond used. repair. And so, Caitlin Clark, that's the only hope here, mm -hmm. is that she's the phenomenon, not that women's college basketball If you're rooting is. for your self-preservation in the hierarchy of Correct. sports Correct, which ratings. is what they are all doing. But I wanted to think about the business side of this, and we're celebrating the 12.3. So when negotiations come up, and you're a rights holder, and you're bidding for the women's tournament, or for... Mm -hmm. Iowa basketball or mm -hmm. big big 15 or big 17 coverage. The existence of Caitlin Clark, who then goes to Indiana. Let's the number pretend, one overall pick in the draft, the Fever. Which, which I believe she'll go number one. I think the Fever have already announced it. They're already Essentially. selling yeah. jerseys. Are you believing that this is a increase in the value of women's college sports? Or are you saying this is a one-off and I will not compensate you for the number well, that was achieved. Well, clearly, if you're the rights holder, you're going to suggest that this is the new bar. If you are negotiating with the rights holder, you can suggest, well, uh, you're not going to have any credibility to say this is a phenomenon and this is going to fall right back down and next year the WNBA ratings will be the same as they were. This is going to lift things. So the person selling the WNBA rights is in a better position to get more money and there'll be a little back and forth about how much. 
but you're not going to get, you're not going to have any effectiveness trying to suggest to the WNBA, oh, Kaylin Clark's not going to matter. The r- women's sports is not itself overall going up. It is. They're going to, and by the way, ESPN just did the deal to renew all of the NCAA and the jewel within that deal, though there are other, very other good stones in there as well, but the jewel is the women's basketball tournament. Mm. They just bought that for what I think was reported for $56 million of what they paid. That's a great buy. I think the it women's- included a lot of sports, but it didn't include the main ones. It was not football, it was not basketball. No, it was over it was $100 million. Dollars. Uh, maybe somebody can get I recollect mm-hmm. something, 110, 112, 100, and that 56 or 60 of that was attributed yes. mm-hmm. to women's basketball. So to, this is what Charlie Baker said, uh, president of the NCAA. Uh, they valued the women's basketball rights specifically at around $65 million annually, or roughly 56%, as John said, of the media rights portion of this deal. That, and by the way, at this point, they're high-fiving and going, we got a great deal, because this is a... I don't remember how long it was, how many years it was. This but. is an eight-year agreement, $920 million for the exclusive rights to 40 championships, including the crown jewel. As so said. in the ninth year of that, it was an eight-year deal? Eight-year deal. Eight-year deal. The eighth year of that deal, $65 million. And it's an average annual, so it's not exactly the same every year. But that's going to look like a spectacular buy. I think this, this is going to become a phenomenon uh, a year after year from now on. So yeah. that's a way to see where my mm-hmm. head is. If they don't bifurcate WNBA and NBA rights, then the WNBA is exactly where it was. It's pretty much that simple for me. And I don't think that Adam Silver will do it. But he either will or won't. We're going to find out. The fact that when you get the WNBA, you when you get the NBA, you I, get it's, I, it's I'm, like ESPN Ocho. I'm not sure I, whether I've seen any reporting on whether they are separating the right sales or not. We're going to find out because that's what I'm saying. They have not been so far. Uh, and the last deal, they were not. The last deal was a, was a package deal. Because the value was the NBA. No, there was value in both leagues. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know I'm not going to give you that I one. know you're and not. And by the way, you, uh, the, give me we, another reason why you wouldn't split them up. I, what is the I, reason why I, you bundle I, assets? I, I paid, uh, we paid real money for the WNBA the previous deal, and we knew that the value was greater in the next deal, and uh, I certainly cannot reveal any of the valuations we did or what we talked about with the league, but the league valued them as well, and they got a nice increase. Why can't you? You're a metal arc now. Um, Can you give us an idea of what It was not my decision whether to buy them separately or together. They were, at that time, packaged together. So you're Adam Silver right now. Are you thinking women's sports is at a place? This is where my head is regarding this story and these ratings. Because people talk about the ratings as though this is the moment for women's sports. And I think those moments get manifested through monetization. And there's an opportunity for that monetization coming up. Yeah, and I can't tell you that I have any familiarity with what's going to happen. In fact, in the last one, it may have been only ESPN that bought it as a package because uh, the other TNT did not buy the WNBA rights, so they bought only NBA rights last time. It wasn't granted up, and so there was some question, as you recall, I, as I, whether yeah. there was a desire to have it. Correct. We wanted it, so and right. we may have wanted it enough to buy it exclusively. Uh, I don't think TNT at the time wanted wanted well, to buy. Well, you're in different businesses. Right. Yes, you need sports. Yes, and we were we were also we were committed to doing women's sports. And there's no while you well I know you will laugh and suggest I'm just was smiling. it good business or not? We believed in it. We believed it was coming. And by the way, everything we spent is going to be uh, is going to be. Um, uh, confirmed that it was smart by this well, that's, college women's that's, basketball deal. This is we invested story. in that, and that is why ESPN still retains the premier position you know, for holding women's sports rights. Yeah, what's fascinating to me here is that this went from a thing that I think rightfully, David, look, you're not alone in suggesting that there was almost a, when it comes to the business, the cold hard capitalism of it, there was a, uh, there was a benefit to the WNBA hiding inside of the NBA deal as opposed to having to subsist on its own. And now what we're seeing is this is not a this is not something. This is not a nonprofit. There's always this sense of like the WNBA, women's college basketball, you care about it because that's what socially conscious people should do. And now what we're seeing is oh, people are watching this because they actually want to watch this thing. 
And that to me is, look, when I was growing up, I did not expect 12.3 million people it's to amazing. watch a game yeah. like this. It's just mind blowing on that level. How many women's games have you watched tip to tap this season? This season? I mean, Total. In the tournament, probably like a dozen. Oh, so I would, I, that would put you on one end of the spectrum, I would think. That's yeah, a I lot. went to this game in person well, because you were, I enjoy could, this. And uh, not that's not why you right, went in let's person. Not, let's not let's give not. me a break, would you? Are we good? Dude. No, I, it's burning up inside me that you want people to think that the rich you guy only the fans is well, you guys, well, not me. No, despite you guys, all not me. evidence to the contrary. <laughs> this is, by the way, this is kind of not hard to believe. There's always an event that everybody secretly wants to be at, right? And it is an amazing fact that that event on this night when LSU played Iowa, that was the event that every sports fan would actually have liked to have been at. And uh, that is a remarkable thing. Uh, I want to, may I use this to slightly comment upon the uh, Kent Babb story? Oh, sure. Uh, which So Kim Mulkey, of course, had complained. We covered this before, John. You mm -hmm. had taken interest in Kim Mulkey, head coach of LSU, preemptively attacking the Washington Post and its reporter, Kent Babb, about a profile, a piece, I should say, an investigative piece, seemingly, that was about to come out. And we talked about that last time, and it came out as expected. It actually was quite a insightful, powerful, 7,000-word look at the Kim Mulkey way. And it was pretty balanced, I thought. Uh, it did yes. acknowledge her success. It acknowledged the loyalty of many of the players for her. It acknowledged her drive, her determination. I thought there was much to admire. Uh, she, I believe, objected to Kent contacting her family members. But, of course, that's de rigueur. If you're going to do something that gives you insight into a person, you need to understand where they came from, who, if you can, who their parents were, and uh, that happened. So I just would tell you, if you want to do some reading after this wonderful LSU-Iowa um, game, you can read Kent Babb's story in the Washington Post, quite good, and then Wright Thompson has another masterpiece on ESPN.com yeah, about Caitlin Clark. That is, if you want to understand Caitlin Clark and the phenomenon, where she came from, Wright spent an entire year uh, in, in um, doing this story. And again, it's, it's worth a read uh, to really understand the athlete who right now, for a moment, and we should celebrate this, and I know uh, I am- not, Don't uh, make me out to I, be I, the I, no, I hate Caitlin Clark guy. No, no, I didn't, never suggested that, but it is a hey, wonderful Pablo. moment where the, this reminds me of the 99ers, right? When the women's soccer team Capture the imagination of the American public. And had a domino effect that lasted beyond yeah. just the blip of, wow, what a, what a detention grabbing What caused thing. that? Was that the, uh, the Brandy, Brandy take, take my shirt off? Well, was that, that the of beginning course, or was that the end? That was, of no, the no, that was at the end. That was the so, end. The, so, no, people tuned in. That game had just short of 30 million viewers. Uh, so that is an astonishing number. That is still, I believe, the largest audience for a soccer game, men's or women's, in the United States. Um, so, and by the way, you had the same thing happen with women's soccer that is now happening with women's basketball. Everybody thought the 99ers was going to mean that the women's soccer league was an immediate success. It wasn't. Uh, they've been struggling Correct. with this for about 10 years, but finally, it is starting to take off. The NWSL, we'll see. And I have no personal interest in the NWSL financially or as a broadcaster, but you will see it doing very well this year, I think. Well, they, they had to clean up about a thousand forest fires of abuse and they, major issues correct. within that league. So there's, there was nowhere to go but up. It was either going to fold or get better well, because I think, the road it was on. I think, on in fact, was, it did fold, I think, twice. was not so good. This is the third incarnation. Um, and yes, and, and of course, the perpetrators in most of those abuse scandals were not women. I didn't like the Kemp Ab story. I'll go on record saying that because I, when Kim Mulkey had a press conference saying that she hired the greatest defamation firm of all time, I thought there was going to be this amazing article about stuff that would blow my socks off. I didn't learn anything. Well, so I, it, you, it's a big you, nothing you learned, burger. You learned some things, just not the things that would have. Yeah, I learned normal things. She she she's, drives her, her kids hard, tough coach. Bobby Knight style, 
but you may see, have a problem you see, with. You see Geraldo's vault here. That's exactly to use another ancient what I saw. Is that because, ancient? It is now. I'm sorry. But because there was a promise of this is a takedown. By her herself. By her herself. And it wasn't that, which is both, I think, a credit to the reporter and to David, a massive disappointment. Yes. Because the expectation was far higher. Looking for a little fight. I wanted something. I wanted yeah. there to be some sort of lawsuit. I, I, I wanted her to stand up. I wanted there to be an epiphany of some sort. It turns out she's just a tough minded, old school, difficult to deal with, successful coach. Yeah, I wouldn't. Um... I, I would put it slightly differently. Yes. But you did learn why she's that way. You learned about her relationship with her father, Les, who left. You understand why she may have some initial distrust of people she doesn't know because she felt she felt abandoned. Daddy and, issues? Look, I, I thought he did a good job. <laughs> I didn't know that. You did, I'm assuming... I um, didn't know yeah, that, yeah. but it's funny. I mean, Oops I among find... us does not have right, daddy so issues. It doesn't David, interest the idea that Reed. David is somehow <laughs> not impressed. We all by... own our daddy issues, exactly. David. Please, come no, on. that's the point. Exactly. So that's I, why I think, it's not. I think it's possible Nelson Peltz was a little <laughs> father figure for David. No. Uh, the felt, Jeffrey Luria he, Nelson clearly. Peltz he mental felt image here in the house. Very... He felt he felt the paternal felt spirit, the ghostly presence, felt the paternal spirit of a man willing to take on the mighty. Mickey uh, Empire. Uh, beneath the pa uh, beneath the painting of Saturn eating his child, I believe, would be the... It was probably a hopper. Very uh -huh. good. Very good. Um, one, a hopper and a skipper. One, before we uh, hop and skip and jump out of here, I do want to ask the question, though, about... And Coco helpfully has highlighted this. Um, the idea that all of the ratings are up, right? Like, so I want to just contextualize this because, of course, there is a clear spike historically for this game, and that is real, as discussed, but... Uh, Michael Mulvihill, Hill, who's the guy at Fox who does the rating stuff over there, he points out that this has been the most watched college football regular season ever, the most watched college basketball regular season ever, the most watched March Madness ever easily through the Elite Eight men and women combined. And so why is this the accounting thing that we've discussed before, David, which I need you to remind people of? What's happening here? So remember the way they're doing it. It used to be the old Nielsen box, which no one ever knew what it was. It was actually sometimes they'd call people. Other times they'd have to click, like keep a diary of what they were watching. And all executives around sports would be dying waiting for the weekly Nielsen ratings that were a bunch of people we could never identify other than their Nielsen families. And we felt like there was signs to it when we were on top of the leaderboard. And we thought that it was absolute horse hockey when we were not. Now... They're recounting it in totally different ways. And we covered this, actually, some of the fighting that went on over how to count who's watching. But they're counting people who are now they're estimating bars out of home viewers, which to me is a great thing to count, but very hard to do. There is a shared interest in the people who measure the audiences with the people they measure them for. The big broadcast networks do not want the numbers to go down, and they have consistently looked for ways to plausibly, not definitively, not exactly, figure out how they could bring bigger numbers to the advertisers, who in fact want them as well, because they want to make 15 and 30 second commercials still, and that's still what this is mostly measuring, because they make a lot of money on that, as opposed to a return on investment, little digital ad that shows up because you and I spoke about something and our phone heard and sold it to us. So they have smartly found ways to grow the audience. I don't believe suddenly there are vast numbers. I don't believe it's exact. As David pointed out, it's, always been, a, it's, it's always been a sample. It isn't, you it's can't the craziest exactly. thing the in the world. It's the we always assume that it's real. And but sampling. It's, so we, you, we keep saying that 12.3 million people watched Pablo with Ted Lasso Monday night. We don't know that it was 12.3 million. I just want to make sure that our audience understands that. That's not the actual number of people who watch the game. It is the number by which companies pay marketing agencies who pay the broadcast networks, yes. all who have a shared interest in figuring out ways that they can plausibly claim a bigger audience, but it's still a sample. It, do, it is, however, somewhat consistent, by which I mean something that did 10, something that did 12, three, something that did 15, the ordering is probably right, the proportion is probably right, but they're probably all counting people who walked into a bar, ordered a beer, and walked out. Uh, and that counted as a viewer. And I don't know how you'd count that person. So 
I, you mentioned a, a train of people who benefit from ratings, and it's an interesting thing to think about because what you're talking about with marketing and marketing budgets and buying ads, and then you sort of glossed over the ad that comes to you digitally, I spend more money as I sit here today with ads that are pushed to me. What have you bought, David? Podcasts, what have you bought? Toiletry kits, blankets, luggage, chargers. You name it. Sounds, I, like, sounds like you're going somewhere. I'm going to send I, you some I travel am. ads. <laughs> but but it's target ads, and it's what every company wants. Yeah. They want targeted ads. They do. There is a problem because while there's that shared interest there, in the new world, uh, you've got a couple of problems. One is the tech companies can measure exactly. They can. Which is scary uh, for everyone. On the other hand, they do not make it possible for any third party to accurately audit that or count right, that. So now you still have a funny problem. The marketers and the and the uh, the companies and the marketers are dependent upon them to tell the truth. And of course, we we of course would believe that too and understand that they would exactly uh, tell you exactly how many. And that's why you hear these weird metrics. Oh. 300 million minutes is how many, much such and such has been consumed. I'm like, well, what good does that right, do? Me? Why do I need to, to know? Yeah. yeah, it's not apples to apples. They will, they will not lie, but they will, they will use the data in the way most favorable to them. Um, magazine, you know, you know, magazine business, they used to count uh, cards. They'd show you a card. Have you read Rolling Stone magazine before? You'd say yes. They'd go, oh, reader. And then they would do a big survey that said, Rolling Stone magazine has a million people who buy the magazine, but eight pass along readers. So their total audience is eight million. The advertiser would pay for eight million. Did eight million people read that magazine? Very unlikely. I would assume then Playboy would be the number one because it was in every barber shop and it was passed uh, along to everybody always. So well, Playboy to... I, actually in those days they measured it by counting the number of fingerprints. On, <laughs> that that on, what they did. Uh... Thank you. I want to go full circle. I don't to, want to know anything else about David Sampson's barber shop. What we Please started Thank you. Uh, with little Matt Ishbia, and one of the parts of that story was the Super Bowl ad. Yeah. And I was just thinking about how a company would defend spending five and a half million dollars on a and an ad on any ad and we watched the Super Bowl and now the ads have QR codes and there's all sorts of things going on with Super Bowl ads. And Ishbia's ad specifically was about brokers and about the very thing that San Pablo Torre finds out. And how do you measure? How does a company who buys a Super Bowl ad measure? Are they doing it for branding or for sales? And what happens is you tell your CEO it's branding because you can't back it up with meaningful direct sales from it's yeah. overwhelmingly branding. Now that UWM ad did have a mechanism where you could respond, so they may have some ability to measure effectiveness. Right, go to this though, website. All but, of this explained but, in the but, episode. But, have but that, almost, but almost none of the advertising on the Super Bowl. All the advertising on the Super Bowl is brand halo, sort of uncountable benefit. Uh, they can tell you which ads people like. They can't tell you how many Buicks they went down and bought because well, they but, saw but, an ad. But but this is kind. Of, I mean, this is fascinating, and it's an enormous topic. We don't have time for all of it, but it's the idea of advertising as a premise of like, what is the return on this investment in the Super Bowl? It's easy because you say we're in the club of people with a Super Bowl commercial, but in reality, how many products did you move has always been. I, there's a there's a very it's always been the issue. There's yeah. a very famous ad guy, and I can't remember which one it was, who said. I know that 50% of my money is wasted. I just can't figure out which 50%. Um, and that's because of the uncertainty of the measurement. And that was also because if his target was men 25 to 54, he gets some data that suggests that this he was reaching, 36% of the people he was reaching was those. Now they do have exact well, data. That's the promise of the well, tech that we're David a victim been... of that. Yes. So the victim is this, that as part of Metalark, we all do reads. I don't know if Pablo Torre is forced to do it in his show because his show. I gladly do. Do them. you? So we have codes, you know, mm -hmm. Lebetard 50 or Samson 25 for some advertisers mm -hmm. who advertise with Metalark. And I always think about the number of people who actually put in that code is always going to be fewer than the number of people who would have some brand awareness right. that, oh, they're a sponsor of Metalark shows. But the way it's measured now, is by how, who actually puts that code in right. that we all Look, read. You go to J. Crew, you buy a pair of pants, did anybody help you with this? 
and you can name Ted in the back or no, I don't remember. I know. And then and it's it, a major thing if you name Ted. Of course, because that is how you get credit for sending business in one direction. You, you know, whenever I get asked on the way out, if somebody's helped me, I put David Sampson. <laughs> Why? At, at random retail stores. It's funny. I do the exact opposite. I say, <laughs> I, I don't know, know David Sampson. No connection. <laughs> Best friends? <laughs> really? Uh, Barely I, friends. I think of people all throughout New York City going, he said David Sampson helped him. That guy who does nothing personal? <laughs> You knew the name of the show. Yeah. That's so all, this, all the people uh, in retail outlets in New York. That's right. All the people who sell David Sampson his toiletries are raving about nothing personal. I want to get, though, to another set of friends. Okay. This is Alex Rodriguez. This is Mark Laurie. Mm -hmm. And this was the team, the duo that was supposed to buy the Minnesota Timberwolves. We've got 10 minutes to do this, so we'll be a little expedient. But there's a lot here, right? This is so a, much. It's about a majority owner in Glenn Taylor who finally was supposed to exit stage left. And yet here remains the majority owner because what happened, David, with this? Story? He's an octogenarian with no heirs. Just so we can be clear that the, this is, uh, he, he could sell it into a foundation. The odd, I mean, he doesn't really want to die with it. It just becomes complicated. So it makes perfect Not sense. Not to him, of course. Well, he'll be at dead. That, at that point, pretty You're simple You're one of those guys? Yeah, pretty simple I'm not worried for him about that. that. You worry about it. I'll be dead. <laughs> I hate those there guys. There's no greater <laughs> distinction between the two worldviews of these two rich guys than that one. <laughs> I'll be dead? I worry John's out of here. About, David is haunting I'm the just, universe. I'm just beginning to worry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's when it gets serious. Anyway. So I Glenn Taylor no is going to sell his team. And he sold it for one and a half billion dollars in 2021 to Alex Rodriguez, who's always wanted to own a team. Except Alex Rodriguez didn't pay the one and a half billion back in 21. He was going to pay it in installments. And then he missed some installment payments. And Glenn Taylor was very forgiving over the course of the last few years. No problem. And that deadline got extended because in a contract, there's deadlines. You have to pay by this time. And you've dealt with contracts in your life. If you don't follow the letter of the contract, there are some people you do business with who say, don't worry about it, we're good. And some people will say, hey, you're in violation. I'm canceling the contract. The people who say you're in violation, I'm canceling the contract, are people who don't want to do business with you anymore. Glenn Taylor doesn't want to do business with A-Rod anymore because Glenn Taylor's team is now worth two and a half billion, not the one and a half billion that he sold at four and 21. Just in that span of time. It's Just in up. that span of time. What exactly is an octogenarian with no uh, heirs going to do with the extra billion? It's, it's, uh, it's a great question. Charity, I hope, and I assume, but he can, he, listen, he may live to be like, like will live to be over a hundred. Well, well, and, and, clearly. He, and he'd clearly need that extra bill to, uh, to, uh, Keep up the lifestyle. So yeah, the cryogenic uh, chamber gets expensive. John Skipper's while. view of owning a team is that he would send it out when he was ready to sell. He'd get bids and sell to the lowest bidder. <laughs> That's what you, somehow, no, uh, and you'd say, this is the right thing to do. You could maybe set the test for, for how you and I are different in that if I were 83, I would not care about an extra billion if I had one already. It wouldn't matter the to me. The only people who say that are people who don't have one. Well, that's true. So, I mean, I, I, I like that that's you true. say it, but it's just a true rap battle a, bar by David that's, Sampson. That's Look like that. in a fencing match. <laughs> that's just like, I got hit right here. I'm done. I'm Leading done. Uh, I don't mean to say it in no, that way. No, no, it was it, because uh, listen, repost, metal arc, half a metal arc, the you're getting close. The was robust. <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> Okay. What's funny Rich about guy the, only fans. This is what I mean. What's funny about the fight going on is that A Rod is trying to say, for the benefit of the fans, Glenn, sell the team because we're really good at owning the team. And look at how good the Timberwolves are this year. They're fighting for the number one seed in the Western Conference. But then A Rod is going on every show, but not on Metal Arc, strangely enough. But every show, we did the South Beach sessions with Dan. We're, we're friendly with Mr. Rodriguez. Okay, so they then, presented him with a painting of a centaur. Then, yes. then I'd like him to come on and discuss. Um, he said, we're going to fight whatever it takes, five years, 10 years, 20 years. We will never stop fighting Glenn Taylor because he went back on his word. We, we will meet is, them is on it, the mountaintops. Is, is, we will this, cross the river. There is a speech like that somewhere. It's not New is Rockney. Is it Vincent Churchill? 
It's either <laughs> David Samson either inside of a tank or atop a horse. Yeah, one of those scenarios. I like the idea speech. of being on top of a horse, but I, I can only say <laughs> whatever. Um, here's how this ends and why it's interesting to me. Because Adam Silver, I think of everything from the commissioner's standpoint. Adam Silver does not want the Timberwolves to be sold to A-Rod at a $1.5 billion valuation. Because it's low. It is far better for him for the Timberwolves to be sold for more. So he is not doing anything to take a position that would favor Alex Rodriguez. He's taking the position of, hey, it didn't close, it didn't close. The Timberwolves are now not for sale. Maybe they'll be for sale again. But what he knows is when they are for sale again, and even if A-Rod is a buyer again, it won't be at the 1-5 number. No. And that matters Particularly since they have one of the uh, best up-and-coming young players have two great young players, uh, so their prospects for the next few years look very good. That's a more like a two and a half to three billion dollar uh, valuation, wouldn't you think? So that's what I do think. Yeah, and that's why. And I'm still young enough, just to be clear, that a billion dollars would still make a difference in my life. Listen, we're I'm, we're <laughs> working on behalf of Metal Ark. Uh-huh. Us and our 25 basis points are yeah. really working we've, hard we've for you. Established... First billion dollar bid we get will be the last. We've established on this show previously that we will also sell all of our principles for a trillion dollars. There's like a escalating, you know, series of what we. I'm way lower than that. Yeah. And and don't hesitate to call if it's like half a trillion, (laughs) just just to check. (laughs) I think that John is making fun of how metal art gets valued. And I take it far more seriously, as I know he does, that we're all doing these shows and doing what we do because we think that this is a billion dollar company. I am pretty sure the valuation went up somewhere in the neighborhood of a sawbuck. How are people going to respect <laughs> us when you don't respect us? Well, probably because possibly some of them don't know what a sawbuck is because I think it's a bit of a... <laughs> can't be a, good. Old, I think it's a bit of an old school term. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, God. After uh, you finish recording, John gets very upset and he'll text me on the side things like, you know, we're not rich guy only fans. I've never he doesn't want to that. be associated like that. I've never so you got to stop doing that. You keep ruining my weekends, Pablo. Stop. I, I feel that. like people have really enjoyed the very broad appeal references to art that we've made all show today. Hopper and Skipper. Yeah, Hopper and Skipper. So on this A Rod story, just to put a pin in that one, it's it's going to continue, but the fight is. So gonna... these guys, but I want to say, like, this is the the fight. Like, they're not allowed in the building. Like there's, I want to get the. uh... So Glenn Taylor came out and said that all the things that I was letting you do, A-Rod, because you were going to be the controlling owner, like getting into the clubhouse and going in the back areas, you do not have to let your limited partners do that. Communicate with team execs anymore. We did not let our limited partners communicate with anybody. They couldn't call the GM. The GM doesn't want to take a call from a limited partner, and that's what A-Rod is. Limited partners can't walk to the clubhouse or walk behind the scenes to the kitchen area. What percentage of the cl- club does he own, A-Rod? Uh, he and Mark Laurie have 40%. I would think you'd let the guys who own 40% that's come why on it, back into the dining that, room. It's okay. That's why it feels again, like they're a, in a fight. fight. So it, they're, that, they're that's in why a, fight, a fight. And it's very limiting to be a limited partner, yeah. as you know. It's, uh, it's, it's like being a limited shareholder in Disney. If you own 100,000 shares, you feel rich, but you have no power. Nelson Peltz, you get into the billions and, of dollars, and all of a sudden you can do a proxy fight. As opposed to being a limited shareholder of Metal Ark, which you get benefits like hanging out with David Sampson as he regales you with tales of his childhood. On a horse. On a horse. See you later. Thank Hate you, Pablo. Things. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you both. Sorry for ruining your weekends.